which I think all four teams could definitely win the national championship. This is the first time we've gone into the college football playoff where I felt like all four teams could legitimately win it. I think this is the first time. That's right. I really believe it. I think it's the best collection of playoff teams we've seen in the college football playoff era. There is not a weak link. There is not a team that is going to get blasted. I think all four teams, if they play well, are very capable of winning the national championship. Welcome to Always College Football. It is Friday, December 29th. A lot to be excited about. We have so many great games this weekend to look forward to. We've already had so many great bowl games that have been terrific. We will take some time, I promise you, those that have asked for it. We will break down some of the playoff games uh, some of the some of the bowl games, if you will, we will break down some of those bowl games, but our attention is going to be focused forward. We have some massive, massive matchups coming up, including both semifinal games. We will do extensive 18 minute breakdowns on both the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. So you don't want to miss it. You will not find a more comprehensive breakdown on these college football semifinal games than what you'll get right here on Always College Football. We're also going to break down a trio of other January 1st bowl games. The matchups are very intriguing in some of those two to set the table for what should be an incredible day of college football. January 1st is our holiday, so we're going to focus our attention today on January 1st. We also are going to recap both semifinal games and all of January 1st action from the Superdome in New Orleans Post game, I'm calling Texas and Washington. I'll be watching the Rose Bowl leading up to the game, probably on pins and needles. And then I'll be calling the game right after it. And then from the booth, we will break down those games like we always do in our Sunday takeaways. This will just be a Tuesday takeaway because we'll set the table for not just what happened, but what might be coming in the national championship game. So let's not waste any time. Let's get things kicked off with the Rose Bowl game with an extensive look at both Alabama and the Michigan Wolverines. A couple of blue bloods that are looking to add to their trophy cases. Alabama has 16 national championships, the second most all time behind Yale. Of course, that uh, couple of those are a little predated, if you will. The Tide, however, have 13 national championships in the poll era. That started in 1936. That's the most in the country. Michigan has nine national championships, but only two in the poll era. That'd be 1948 and in 1997. They, of course, split in the final championship with Nebraska prior to the advent of the BCS. So a lot that's happened with these two programs, traditionally top two ever as far as wins, a very exciting time and a very exciting matchup. Now, one thing, historically speaking, the one versus four matchup has been a little bit more favorable to the higher seed. The number one has won this game seven out of the nine times it's been played. However, one silver lining if you're the four team the two teams that won this game ultimately went on to win the national championship. That would be 2014 Ohio State and 2017 Alabama. This will be the sixth time the SEC and the Big Ten will meet in the college football playoff, and the SEC currently holds a 4-1 to one advantage. The Big Ten sole win was that 2014 Ohio State team who beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl back in yeah, Jan 1 of 2015. So, Let's talk a little bit about last year. Michigan's been in this position before. They were a significant favorite last year against TCU, about seven and a half points. That's a pretty significant number, though, when you really th take into account. Michigan fell down early. They were down 21-3 there in the first half. Came within three points in the fourth quarter, but they had turnovers and goal line issues and other pick six. I mean, they just really didn't play very well. They were terrible on third down. They were just three of 13, and they couldn't stop the run, which is really weird because when you look at what – Michigan's kind of built their program on it's running the football, stopping the run. They give up 263 and three touchdowns last year against TCU, which ultimately cost them a chance at the title. This year, they have been completely dominant. Uh, from the start of the season to where they're at right now, they have only trailed for 23 minutes and 29 seconds. It's pretty ridiculous when you take that into account. Less than one half of football, they've been behind in a 13-game season. The next closest mark, that's actually the Texas Longhorns, they were down by about 64 minutes and 18 seconds. So they have been dominant. Michigan's also outscored their opponents by about 27 points per game. That's the best in the country. Now, you would think in, from a talent discrepancy standpoint that Alabama would probably have a bit of an edge 
Uh, it's not exactly the case. Now, as far as the top tier, the top players, according to Mel Kuyper and his latest big board, Bama has three of the top 22 players on their roster. That'd be J.C. Latham, their tackle. That'd be Dallas Turner, their excellent defensive end outside linebacker. He's actually the best player on either team right now. Number 11 on the big board, according to Mel Kuyper. And then Kool-Aid McKinstry, the corner, he comes in at 21st. But as far as depth, Michigan actually has a little bit more. J.J. McCarthy's a fifth quarterback. Blake Corum's a fourth running back. Donovan Edwards, the ninth running back. A.J. Barner, the tight end, is the number, is the tenth tight end. Uh, Drake Nugent, sixth center. I mean, you look kind of down the list. Chris Jenkins, the fourth defensive tackle. Junior Colson, the seventh linebacker. They actually have a very, very deep group. I'm not going to go through line by line. But if you look at what Michigan has compared to what Alabama has, they really stack up quite favorably, just not quite at the top. You don't see anybody on Michigan's team right now that is in the top 15, top 20, top 25 picks, according to Mel Kuyper. Of course, a lot can change. Let's start with the offenses on both sides. Both teams really mirror each other with their personnel group they want to be in 12 personnel. 12 personnel is one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers. Both teams, very heavy involvement in 12 personnel. Michigan is actually the third highest rate of 12 personnel in the country. Alabama, they were really 11 personnel a lot in the last couple of years under Bill O'Brien. That's one running back, one tight end, and three wide receivers. That was who they were under Bill O'Brien. They've now shifted this season. They're in 12 personnel about 40% of the time. That's eighth in college football. So those two teams want to feature two tight ends, and these tight ends are very important to what they do on the offensive side. If you look at what Michigan is offensively, they're not great as far as explosiveness. They're not great as far as yards per play, just 43rd in yards per play, but they are very efficient. They've committed just five turnovers. That's the third fewest in the FBS. And they also average 3.2 points per drive, which is sixth in the FBS. They have really not allowed a lot of negative plays either. They stay on schedule. And outside of the service academies, there's nobody in college football that stays on schedule better than Michigan. 179 plays that went for zero or negative yards. So they like to stay on schedule, like to stay ahead of the sticks. And that's why they've been so efficient this year. They are third in plays of zero negative yards. They are 43rd in plays of 20 plus yards. So not a really a big play offense, just 61 plays this year that have gone for 20 plus yards. So not great, but they don't commit penalties, just 19 on the year that's fourth best in the country, and they do not lose turnovers. They've given up just five to mention that already. Like they said, they also stay ahead of schedule. On third down, their average yards to gain is just six yards a gain, uh, six yards. So they average third and six or so. That's the third shortest in the FBS behind Georgia and Air Force. So they are a very, very efficient group. Meanwhile, Alabama on the other side took them a little while to get going. And if you guys missed any of our breakdowns, we did a team-by-team -team breakdown, an extensive team-by-team -team breakdown last week and the week before, documenting Michigan, documenting Bama, and one of their kind of going line by line their entire roster. So if you missed those, make sure you check them out. But Alabama's offense has really been a tale of two seasons. They were really not great, not very consistent in the first eight weeks of the season, but really the last five games, they really took off. And in the first eight games, they had just two games in which they went over 400 yards. That would be against Middle Tennessee, against Arkansas. But in the last five, they went over 400 yards in four of the final five games. So they've done a really good job down the stretch of playing much better and doing a much better job of not being quite as boom or bust. They were a very big play-oriented offense. That's changed a little bit. They're a little more efficient. They're a little more willing to take the underneath. And I think Jalen Milrow has upped his level of play considerably. We'll talk about him here in just a minute. Another thing to keep in mind in this game, field position could be very important. Michigan has been excellent this year with their starting field position. They average start is at the 35-yard line. That's the best in the FBS. So field position... A game that might be where points are at a premium. More on that in a minute, too. Field position might be very important. Third down, of course, huge in a game like this. And looking at Michigan's third down numbers, they're actually a little bit shocking. <laughs> thinking about what they are, thinking about who they are, they're really not very good on third downs of six or less. Third and three or less, they convert 61% of the time. That is 87th in the country. Uh, third and four to six, 31% conversion, that's 120th in the country. But when they get in third and long, third and seven plus, they convert 44%, which is the best in college football. So it's kind of counterintuitive when you think about what Michigan is. You would think they'd be a really good third down team. They're really not. Actually, the worse they are as far as line to gain, the better they play, which is 
pretty crazy when you take that into account. All things considered, they convert about 47% of the time. They're 15th in the country, but they got to be better, obviously, on the short yardage. And when they are sitting there from one to six, third down one to six, they got to be better in this game. Alabama has been very good on third down all season long. They actually 14th in the FBS, but I said tale of two seasons. The last five games, they're well above 50%, and they're excellent when they get in third and short situations. They're first in the FBS on third and short situations. So that, I think, is very, very important when you take this into account. So whatever team's staying on schedule, Bama's been more likely to extend the drive. And then you look at the Michigan defense, by the way, they're pretty good on third down as well, 15th. So all these teams, very good on third down. It could be impactful, but it wasn't really a huge discrepancy. I just found Michigan's numbers, one to six, being worse, really, than seven to seven plus. I didn't expect to see that. We're diving into the numbers just a little bit. Let's get to the quarterback matchup. J.J. McCarthy is 25-1 and as the starting quarterback. Uh, he's done a great job. I mean, he's really done a great job. But one thing he does not do, there's not a lot of passes behind the line of scrimmage. There's not a lot of passes that are short and on the underneath side. He wants to push the ball down the field. They want to live in the intermediate passing attack, and he wants to challenge the middle of the field, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Jalen Milrow. Really, the offense is gone as, as he's gone. The first seven games that he played, remember he missed the game against South Florida. His total QBR in those first seven games, just 76. But in the last five, he's at 91. Considerably improved. And the biggest thing that's changed is he has not taken as many sacks these last five games. In the first seven games, he took 30 sacks. In the last five games, he took eight, including four against Georgia in the SEC championship game. So the sack numbers have been a big improvement for the Alabama signal caller. As far as their pass catchers are concerned, let's start with Michigan's pass catchers against Bama's back end. Roman Wilson, he is the team leader in receiving yards and has accounted for over half of the team's receiving touchdowns. He's been the main target in the intermediate. His average air yards per target is about 14 yards downfield, and 24 of his 41 receptions have been at least 10 yards downfield. So he's not a catch-and-run guy. He's a guy that's going to get to the intermediate and that's where they're going to find them. He's really worked primarily out of the slot. That's where he lives. So he's going to be matched up a lot with the nickel, the safety for Alabama. Could be a difficult matchup for the Tide. But he is, I think, a very solid wide receiver that's probably a little underappreciated nationally. Cornelius Johnson actually leads the team in receptions, believe it or not. He'll line up primarily as the X receiver, the weak side receiver, really good with the ball in his hands, very, very good after the catch. He's probably one of the more explosive guys. Not not like ridiculously polished, but very, very solid at wide receiver. I think they're underappreciated at wide receiver. They really are. They don't have first round picks, but they're very good at what they do and they don't miss on opportunities. One of the guys that Bama should be paying very close attention to is the tight end though, Colston Levelin. His best game actually came against Ohio State, had five catches for 88 yards in that game. And Alabama has struggled at times this year against tight ends. They've allowed 465 yards to tight ends this season. That is 101st in the FBS. And the best tight end they saw this year is Jatavion Sanders. I know that we're talking about Brock Bowers, but Brock Bowers a little limited in the SEC championship game. But the last time they saw a guy that is fully healthy that's going to contribute as much to the passing game besides Brock Bowers was Jatavion Sanders. He went for 114 back in week two. Brock Bowers had five for 53 in the SEC championship, but of course, a little banged up, not nearly at 100%. As far as Bama's back end is concerned, very strong in the secondary. Kool-Aid McKinstry has been solid all year. He had one bad game that was against the Texas Longhorns, but since then, he has been excellent. Really, really good. He's allowed just one touchdown this season. Terion Arnold, uh, they target him the most. Uh, he he faces the most attempts. I understand that because Kool-Aid's on one side. Terion Arnold's probably going to get thrown at an awful lot. But he's really done a good job, I think, throughout the course of the season. Has really stepped up his game when the opportunity has presented itself. And they also have a true freshman in Caleb Downs that has been terrific. Absolutely terrific. And he might draw the unenviable task of having to handle Colston Loveland in this game. That'll be a really interesting matchup to watch. The true freshman, Caleb Downs, who's a superstar in the making against, I think, one of the more athletic, one of the more, I would say, efficient tight ends that you'll find. As far as Alabama's wide receivers against Michigan's back end, Jermaine Burton leads the team in yards and touchdowns. He's been the main deep threat downfield. He's got 10 receptions for 40, 475 yards and three touchdowns on passes thrown 10 yards downfield, 20 yards downfield, excuse me. So he's the guy that they want to hit downfield. He lines up 
really outside, move him on the left, move him on the right, he'll be all over the place. But the emergence of Isaiah Bond has also been really important. He's also another deep threat, but they've involved him a little bit more on the underneath. They've also involved him a little bit more on the catch and run situation. So Mari Lyblack is really your traditional uh, matchup nightmare. Very athletic, very athletic. And he'll line up at the end of the line of scrimmage, which is a difficult place to cover. He's a guy that can create a lot of one-on-one problems for Michigan secondary. As far as what Michigan does defensively, they're a heavy cover three team. They want to have a post safety there in the middle. They want to keep eyes in the backfield. They kind of expect their corners to play in man type techniques, but they're going to be backed off just a little bit. You look at what they are, they are Mike Sanders still, really boomer bust, excellent player though, very instinctive, makes a lot of plays. Josh Wallace, uh, also an ex- uh, excellent player, has not allowed a touchdown this season. And then the headliner, Will Johnson, has done a really good job. He really gave up very few passes down the field this year, except for when he played Marvin Harrison, which, by the way, is not the end of the world. It happens. Uh, he is excellent. So very much look forward to seeing the matchup between Bama's wide receivers and some of those players on the front for Michigan on the perimeter. Uh, as far as the pass rush is concerned, Bama, it really comes down to a couple guys. All right, Igby Ogby, uh, Chris Braswell, Dallas Turner, those are the guys that you need to know. They're going to create a lot of heat, particularly from the edges. That'll be significant. And you look at Michigan's pass rush, they're really good as far as pressure percentages. They have a really deep group of defensive linemen. They have nine players that have played at least 200 snaps at defensive line or linebacker. Jalen Harrell is the guy that you really need to be mindful of. Josiah Stewart is also excellent. You better be careful because Mike Sainer still will blitz off the edge and will create some problems if you do not have your antenna up. A couple of key matchups here. Can Michigan run the ball? Michigan wants to run the ball between the tackles. That's what they are. That could be an issue for Alabama. They did not play as well between the tackles this year as they have in the past. They give up about four and a half yards per carry between the tackles at 68th in the FBS. They are allowing 1.7 yards per carry with eight defenders in the box. That's the 15th best in the FBS. So Alabama, will they put another safety at or near the line of scrimmage to talk Michigan out? of trying to run the football. That's the first matchup. The second matchup is Michigan's pass rush against Jalen Milrow. Now, Jalen Milrow, because of his playing style, he's going to hold the ball a little bit longer. He holds the ball the second longest of any quarterback in the country at 3.25 seconds. That's how long, on average, it takes for him to throw the football. The leader, by the way, in the clubhouse, Central Michigan's Jace Bauer. He does get sacked quite a bit, but I reference the fact that it's been a lot better in the final five games of the year. When he does get out of the pocket, He is pretty dang good at being able to extend plays. And when he gets outside the pocket, that average time spent before he delivers it jumps to 4.63 seconds. So he's pretty good when he gets outside the pocket and has been more willing to run the football when that opportunity presents itself as well. So can Michigan's pass rush get home against Jalen Milrow? One other thing that I'm looking at in this game too, which team's going to hit the big plays? JJ McCarthy does not throw the ball deep very often. The few times that he does, he's been pretty successful. He's 18 of 37 on throws that travel 20 or more yards downfield. Not bad, 49%, 6-1, touchdown to interception ratio. Against Penn State, Ohio State, and Iowa, though, the three best defenses that he faced, he's 0 for 3 on deep balls. Alabama's been pretty good against the deep balls. They don't allow a lot of deep passes. They've given up just 14 of 45. But against Jaden Daniels, Quinn Ewers, Max Johnson, and Joe Milton, some of the better quarterbacks they've faced this year, they have had a little bit more success on pushing the ball downfield. Meanwhile, Jalen Milrow has been one of the best in the country when it comes to throwing the ball down the field. He attempts a lot of passes too. 62 attempts that have traveled 20 or more yards downfield. He's 33 of 62, 14 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio. That's pretty dang good. About about a quarter of his attempts travel at least 20 yards. That's the second highest among Power 5 players. Garrett Green at West Virginia has the highest percentage, just 1% higher though at 26%. Michigan has not given up a lot of deep balls this year, but I think that will be an area that could very much determine the game. And then finally, JJ McCarthy, they are going to want to push the ball off play action between the hashes. That's where he makes a lot of money. (laughs) He's 16 of 21 on throws between the hashes. So he's going to try to work the middle of the field. Not a lot of quarterbacks in college football are doing that. He's going to want to work the middle of the field. And if he can... That could be a difficult thing for Alabama. They're really, Bama doesn't give up a ton in the middle of the field. They're pretty good at safety, but they have not really been attacked the way they're going to be attacked 
by Michigan on throws that are in the middle of the field. So that'll be interesting. And then, of course, turnovers always significant in this game. Bama's had just eight this year. So Michigan's got five. Bama's got eight. Neither team real turnover prone. So it'll be interesting. A couple trends in this game. Alabama's been favored in 77 straight games against non-SEC foes. The last time Alabama was an underdog outside the SEC was in 2008 against Clemson. So it's been a very, very long time. This is the first time they've been an underdog to a team other than Georgia since the 2009 SEC championship game. So this is very unfamiliar territory for the Tide right now. But a couple things to feel good about if you're Alabama. Michigan's 0-6 against the spread in their last six bowl games. That's tied for the longest active against the spread losing streak in bowls behind West Virginia, who, by the way, broke that streak with a win just the other day. The over-under in the game is at 45 and a half. That's the second lowest over-under total in a playoff game. The only lower total was in the title game in 2017 between Alabama and Georgia, which closed at 45. Alabama won that game 26-23 because of Tua Tunga by Loa finding Devontae Smith in overtime to win the game and ultimately to hit the over. I like Alabama in the game. I think they have a little more explosiveness. I think they have a little bit more of an opportunity to create downfield opportunities. I think their defense will shore up against what is an excellent rushing attack for the Michigan Wolverines. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta, We'll be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating. Pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Moving over to the Sugar Bowl. Now, historically, in the college football playoff semifinals, the 2-3 matchup has been very, very close. The three seed actually has a 5-4 and four record. Texas makes their college football playoff debut, and Washington, of course, is in for the second time. Now, I think when you look at kind of just how things are sorting out. Uh, it's pretty amazing how these teams match up. I mean, you look at the first matchup in the Rose Bowl between Michigan and Alabama, two teams that are really built from the same cloth. These two teams, especially on the defensive side, built very similarly. So this is a fantastic matchup, and I'll explain why here as we navigate throughout. They did play last year in the bowl game, and if you look at just how that thing figured out, Washington ultimately won the game, and Michael Penix he didn't really do the things that he's done all season long, pushing the ball down the field, big plays, big plays, big plays. I mean, last year, I mean, he was all short, a lot of short throws kind of all throughout. It was not ideal, <laughs> not ideal with his performance on throws downfield. He was just four of 20 on throws that were 10 plus yards downfield. He also threw an interception. So last year's matchup, I do think there's application. I've watched it. <laughs> I, I do not think it's, really the same type of approach that we're going to see from Washington. So it'll be interesting to see just how different it is. Let's start with the quarterbacks in the matchup. Now, Michael Penix uh, has been amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing. He needs 282 passing yards to become the first FBS player since Patrick Mahomes in 15 and 16 with back-to-back -back seasons of 4,500 yards. And he's going up against a defense that has allowed five of its opponents to throw for 300 plus. That's the third most in the FBS. So we know if you're going to get yards against Texas, it's likely going to have to be through the air. And it does feel, at least at the moment, like Michael Penix is capable of probably putting together one of his best performances of the season. Remember, we're in a dome, too. They've played a bunch of games in weather. Dome setting there in New Orleans will make it a little bit easier on the quarterbacks. Quinn Ewers has also been excellent this season. 
He does a great job of getting the ball out on time. He does a great job of getting the ball out early. And as a result, they've really taken advantage of yards after catch. 61% of Quinn Ewer's 3,161 passing yards have actually been after the catch. That's the fifth highest rate among Power 5 quarterbacks with a minimum of eight starts. Of course, because he had to miss a couple games. He's also been super efficient in the fourth quarter. Of course, as a quarterback, you're going to make your money in the fourth quarter. The best ones play great on third down. They play great in the red zone, and they play great in the fourth quarter of these football games. He's completed 39 of 47 passes for 566, 5-0 and zero touchdown interception ratio in the fourth quarter. That 98.8 QBR and 83% completion percentages, that's the best in fourth quarter marks by all FBS quarterbacks over the last 20 seasons. So it's pretty remarkable when you take that into account. At the running back spot, I think Washington is very underappreciated on the ground. Now, Dylan Johnson is one of just six Power 5 running backs with 1,100-plus yards and 1,400 rushing touchdowns this year. He's difficult to bring down. He runs angry. He runs physical. And he's really at his best outside the tackles. He averages 3.8 yards after first contact on those carries. That's the sixth most among the 56 qualified Power 5 players. So he, when he gets out against smaller personnel, he's going to make them feel it and he's going to fall forward. And really over the last six games, it's really when he's become a much bigger part of what they're trying to be offensively. 767 yards in the last six games. Nine touchdowns in the last six games. Oklahoma State's Ollie Gordon is the only FBS player with more rushing yards since week nine of the season. So he's accounted for a team-high 32% of Washington's scrimmage yards over that stretch. So he is a very underappreciated piece for the Washington offense. And if you look at the Texas offense, we know it's a group that wants to play play action. It's a group that wants to really run the football, a group that wants to create balance with their looks. And I think they have a really good running back trio. That's right, trio. There was a time in which Jonathan Brooks was the bell cow. He got hurt against Kansas State, unfortunately, so he, of course, will not be available for this game. But they have not really dropped off a ton at the position. C.J. Baxter is a little bit young, but in the open field, he's super dynamic. I think Jaden Blue is a guy that I didn't know a lot about coming into the season. I will fully admit. I feel like I know Texas pretty well. I knew nothing about Jaden Blue until I watched him play against Texas Tech and a couple games prior to that. And he has now taken off. He's got better top end speed than I would imagine. He has a nice little hesitation step before he gets very decisive. So he has one move, but he uses it very well. And then Keelan Robinson, who had a very big game against Oklahoma State, he's kind of that Swiss Army knife. Get him the ball in space. He's very, very quick. He's very athletic. And he's excellent when he gets outside on the perimeter in a one-on-one situation. So very good running backs on both sides of the ball for both Washington and for Texas. Also elite wide receiver play on both sides of the ball for both Washington and Texas. Roma Dunze and Jalen Polk. Tandem that has gone for 1,000 yards. One of just four wide receiver tandems in the country that has gone for north of 1,000. Odunze and Polk, they really do a lot of their work downfield. Odunze averages 14.9 air yards per target. That's the most among all Power 5 pass catchers. But Polk, not too far behind. 13.3 air yards per target. That's fourth in the Power 5. So if you look at both those guys, they want to get their hay down the field, and they've done a really nice job in doing that. Jalen McMillan is back and healthy, which is significant. He's great on the underneath stuff. He's really good on going across the middle. He, I think, is a very reliable piece Now that those two are going to stretch the field vertically, you get uh, Jalen McMillan, who's going to create plenty of space on the underneath. And then I think they have a very underrated tight end core as well. And don't forget about Jeremy Bernard, who's excellent with the ball in his hands. Get him on jet sweeps, get him on catch and runs, get him on screens. They have a really well-rounded and diverse wide receiver core that can create a lot of issues for the opposing defense. Texas, though, on the other hand, very similar. Xavier Worthy, will he be at 100%? A massive question mark in the game. He's been banged up at times this year. He got banged up in the Texas Tech game. Actually left the game twice. He also got banged up against Oklahoma State, but when he got back against Oklahoma State and came out of the locker room, he was in a boot and he had crutches. I don't know whether or not he's available. All that Steve Sarkeesian said at this point is that x-rays were negative. What does that mean? I don't know. In the event in which he's not at 100%, though, that is significant because it's really been three wide receivers that have shouldered the load for Texas this year. It's Xavier Worthy, 
who is absolutely the go-to guy. He's got great speed. He's got great catch and run. He can win down the field. He's an excellent pass catcher. Uh, he also does a great job of creating separation on double moves. So he is massive. But A.D. Mitchell is very capable of being a number one guy. He's got great length at six foot five. If you look at his targets and where he is getting targeted in the field, I think he's got 18 or 19 end zone targets. So with him in the end zone, he's got 18 or 19 targets. So when closer they get to the end zone, the more likely they are to be looking in the direction of A.D. Mitchell. But he is a guy that playing for Georgia over the last two years has shown the bigger the game, the better he'll play. I would expect A.D. Mitchell to have a really big afternoon. Jordan Whittington, also a guy that I think is remarkably reliable, remarkably trustworthy. He's going to be great on third down. One part of Jordan Whittington's game is I think he's very underappreciated after the catch. He can make you miss a little bit. He's not going to burn you. He's not going to be a guy that's going to run 4-3, that's going to threaten you deep. He's going to catch the ball. He's going to make you miss, and he's going to run with some power because he does have some size to his advantage. And then maybe the biggest matchup nightmare of them all is their tight end, Jatavion Sanders. He's one of the most prolific tight ends in Texas history. Two years, 93 receptions, 1,220 receiving yards. That's the second best mark in a career by a Texas tight end behind David Thomas, who had 98 catches in 1367. That was way back from 2002 to 2005. Brock Bowers is actually the only FBS tight end with more receptions and yards over the last two years. So that should tell you all you need to know about the weaponry that Texas and Washington have. As far as the defenses are concerned, we'll start with Texas. Texas has the Outland Trophy winner along their front. That's Tavondre Sweat. He's a run-stopping monster. He leads the team in run stops. 9% of the runs he faces, he stops at or behind the line of scrimmage. He can provide a bit of a pass rush inside, but he's just a big 360-pound beast that's going to walk your center back. And if you look at Washington center, Parker Brailsford's only 275 pounds. That is not a matchup that you want if you are Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb, the offensive coordinator. So Devondre Sweat, number 93, will be keeping a close eye on him. But the guy that I think can impact this game more is Byron Murphy. He can beat you with power. He can beat you with quickness. He's great on third down. And you can even kick him out the defensive end from time to time too. He can play inside and out. Byron Murphy is a guy that would give me the most sleepless nights if I were preparing for this defensive front. And then underappreciated weapons on the edges. Ethan Burke who did miss the BYU game, but has seen snaps increase against Oklahoma, seen snaps increase against TCU and Houston. Teams that want to throw the ball, Ethan Burke's going to have a big role. I would expect a big role for him. And then Baron Sorrell was amazing against Kansas State. I think he generates an awful lot of pressure, and the other guys clean it up. Baron Sorrell is a guy that is, I think, very much underappreciated along the front. In the second level, Jalen Ford, he's probably pound for pound their best player and the freshman Anthony Hill who can come up off the edge and blitz but he also can rush the passer in a two down or a two point stance they're really good at linebacker really really good at linebacker the back end is where i would have some concerns the safeties in particular are an issue they've rolled a bunch of guys in another lineup but the results have been for the most part mixed jaron thompson crawford taff Catalan, who's in the portal, all have at times really struggled. And then Derek Williams has been put in and has played quite a bit down the stretch. He's probably their best cover safety. He'll miss the first half of this football game because of a targeting foul that occurred in the Big 12 championship. So his absence will be something that we will document there early in the game because if he's out, there could be a bit of a drop-off there at the safety spot as far as coverage is concerned. Now, Jaron Thompson's going to be the other guy that's going to get a most of the most of the load, he got beat up at times. A little bit of a liability in coverage in the back end against Houston, in particular. He gave up six for six for one hundred or for eighty-one yards and a touchdown. So need to be very careful and making sure he is not matched up in a one-on-one -on -one situation with this elite wide receiver court. They do have an excellent nickel and Jade Barron. He's really good. Really, really good, really instinctive, excellent tackler, rarely misses tackles. He's a very, very confident player. He'll take some chances. He's not afraid to roll the dice. And most of the time, the dice rolls have been very profitable for the Texas secondary. On the perimeter, you'll have Terrence Brooks, really good cover guy. He's come on strong, has played better as the season's gone along. And then Malik Muhammad will be the other guy as well. Keep an eye on Ryan Watts, he's missed some time uh, down the stretch. So if he's at 100%, will he be in the game? But those will be the three guys mostly that you'll see there for the Texas Longhorns. As far as Washington's defense is concerned. Now the edge rotation 
is something that we'll be paying close attention to. The headliner is Braylon Trice. The sack numbers are not going to blow your mind. 41 tackles, 8.5 tackles for loss, 5 sacks, but the pressure numbers are another level. Uh, he had 51 pressures this year. He gets pressure about you know 1 out of 8 snaps, which is pretty decent. Not elite, but pretty decent. But I think the numbers don't reflect how capable he is. And Zion Tupolu, uh, Tupu, <laughs> Tupula Fatui, all right? He is their second best pass rusher, formerly known as, or I guess more appropriately known as ZTF. He is excellent. Uh, he has lost a little bit of weight, has had some injury, has had to deal with some, with some personal family problems. He lost his father. So he's had a lot of things that he's had to deal with this year, but he has come on strong as the season's gone along. So keep an eye on him. And then one other name that you need to know, Zach Durfee. Now, Zach Durfee was ineligible all season long. The NCAA said that he couldn't do it. He had a prior transfer to a four-year school, but he now has been ruled eligible for this game. And according to people that are familiar with his skill set, he's a guy that could very much have a significant impact on this game. So that's the edges. In the middle, it's Tuli Latuli Sanoa. He missed a couple times, a uh, couple games this year, but when he's been in there, he is without question their best run stopper, very physical, very strong they're in the middle of the defense. At the second level, Carson Brewer, who got the start against Oregon State and really kind of took things from there, he's been excellent. I expect him to have a significant role in the game. And Edufan Yulifashio is also a guy that's very, very solid. So I think they're very solid there at the second level. And in the secondary, if you remove Jabbar Muhammad, they've been a little bit up and down. Now, they've had a couple safeties that have missed quite a bit of time. They've had a ton of injuries all over the place. Fabicki Lonnan's missed some time. Asa Turner's missed some time. They've had a bunch of guys in and out of the lineup. So the safety spot has been problematic. But they are getting healthy at the right time. And at the moment, we're anticipating all hands on deck for the Washington Huskies. All right, a couple of the things that we need to address, a couple of the questions that we need to answer to figure out whether or not Washington and or Texas will win the game. Texas is a team that relies heavily on play action. So question number one, will Washington fall victim to Texas's play action? Now, we know that Quinn Ewers and the Longhorns, they run play action about half the time. Only Cal at 52% does play action more in the FBS. And the Huskies this year, they're giving up almost 80 yards per game on play action. That is 81st in the FBS. And if you look at the Longhorns, they crushed Oklahoma State in their last time out in the Big 12 championship game off play action. Quinn Ewers was 17 of 20 for 172 and three touchdowns against Oklahoma State off play action. So can Washington somehow stop the run without having to commit too much because play action is such a big part of what Steve Sarkeesian and the offense wants to do? Question number two. Will Washington try to create balance offensively? If you look at what they were in the first seven games, 65 to 35 past the run, right? That was the ninth highest passing rate in the FBS in the first eight games of the season, right? But in the last handful of games, that passing rate dipped to 56%. So they've become more balanced as the season's gone along. And we already talked about Dylan Johnson and how his productivity has increased significantly over the last handful of games. But they are facing a defense that is incredible against the run. The Longhorns have faced five of the 23 Power 5 running backs that have rushed for at least 1,000 yards this season, and every single one of them was held under 100 yards. The last Power 5 running back to rush for 100 yards in the game against Texas was actually Washington's Wayne Talapapa last year when he ran for 108 in the Alamo Bowl. So will Washington try to create some balance offensively? I would imagine they will, but most of which will be on the perimeter with some pin and pull techniques and some perimeter run game. The next question that we have to answer, can Texas defend the pass outside the numbers? Michael Penix makes a living outside the numbers. He's thrown 2,002 yards outside the numbers this year. He has 17 passing touchdowns. Outside the numbers, that's tied for second most in the FBS, trailing only Jaden Daniels, who, of course, won the Heisman Trophy. But Jaden Daniels only had 19 to Michael Penix's 17. Of course, he's the runner-up for a reason. But still, Penix was the real deal on throws that are outside the numbers in isolation types of situations. Now, Texas' defense has given up nearly 1,400 passing yards outside the numbers this year. That's the third most in the FBS. Only Vanderbilt and Sam Houston have allowed more. Meanwhile... Texas has allowed opposing quarterbacks to complete 60% of their throws outside the numbers as well. That's the third worst in the Big 12. And final question, 
Can Texas force Michael Penix outside the pocket? We talked about the pass rush. We talked about the players. But if Texas can force Penix to flush from the pocket, he becomes a lot less accurate when he's on the move. He completes just 41% of his passes outside the pocket. That's 56th among the 58 qualified FBS quarterbacks. Now, Texas allowed opposing quarterbacks to complete just 43% of the passes outside the pocket this season. That's the 12th best rate in the FBS. So can they move Michael Penix off the spot? If they can, that would go a long way in helping Texas's defense, which has at times struggled against the pass, to slow down what is one of the most prolific passing attacks in the country. A couple trends in this game. Washington is 4-0 outright as an underdog under Kylian DeBoer. Kylian DeBoer is 6-2 outright and 7-1 against the spread in his career as an underdog, including his time at Fresno State. Washington is 4-0 outright and 3-0-1 against the spread against AP Top 10 teams against Kylian DeBoer. And Washington is 9-0 outright and 6-2-1 against the spread against ranked teams under Kylian DeBoer. And overs are 4-1 in Washington games this year against ranked teams, Texas games against ranked teams. Also, those overs are 4-1. and one. I'll be calling the game, so I will not make a pick, but I know it'll be a terrific matchup there in New Orleans. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper, which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right, the fans are back, and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint. Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Moving into a couple more bowl games that'll be played on January 1st. Of course, it's a holiday. It's a holiday if you are a college football fan. We're not going to spend a ridiculous amount of time on these games, but there is some interesting things to kind of would note. When it comes to these Jan 1 games, a couple of big matchups in particular, LSU and Wisconsin, we'll start there. The ReliQuest Bowls will be Monday, January 1st, noon Eastern time on ESPN2. A couple of things that I noted here that I was a little surprised by. All right, let's start one. Wisconsin is 8-1 and one in bowl games over the last 10 seasons. That's the best record of any team in the country over that span. Of course, different Wisconsin team now. Not not the same regime that was there for a very long time. The offense has kind of had some struggles this year. But 8-1 and one in bowl games says a lot about the team's culture. I think it says a lot about how they have consistently bought in in games like this. It also says that maybe they've had some favorable matchups. But still, one thing to consider, very, very, very good in bowl games are the Badgers. Uh, contrast in styles. When you look at LSU this year, the over hit. In nine of their 12 games. Now LSU averaged 46 points per game. They were the number one team in college football as far as points scored. And then meanwhile, Wisconsin, we anticipated this offensive juggernaut. Like Phil Longo's going to go in, the offense is going to take off. It never really materialized. The under actually hit nine of their 12 games. Uh, that's the fifth highest under percentage in the FBS. So when you look at this, very contrast in styles. And we actually will see that in a couple other games that we'll talk about here in just a moment. Now, Jaden Daniels, the Heisman Trophy winner, will not play. Also found this surprising. He's the first Heisman Trophy winner to voluntarily skip a bowl game during his Heisman season. Isn't that wild? Because I think most Heisman winners are either playing in the playoff or they've been underclassmen. Lamar Jackson, for instance, was a sophomore when he won the Heisman Trophy and still played in their bowl game. I believe that game was against LSU there in the Citrus Bowl. Now, the offense is going to look a little look a little different with Garrett Nussmeyer at quarterback. Now, he's played sparingly this year, but if you look at what happened with Jalen Daniels, they were about 28%. They were, not, or excuse me, 9% of their pass plays, they were RPO. It's a little bit more drop back, a little bit more, hey, survey the field, take off if it's there, what have you. It's only 9% of RPO, but with Nussmeyer in the game, they run a ton of RPO, 28% to be exact when he's in the ball game. That would be first in the FBS if he qualified. But the yards per attempt does drop significantly. With Jaden Daniels' drop back, push the ball down the field. They're averaging about 12 yards per attempt. But when you look at what Garrett Nussmeyer is, it's about six yards per attempt. So it's a little bit more dink and dunk, a little bit more methodical, but he does have a big arm, and he will take chances. Garrett Nussmeyer is not afraid to take chances and to throw in a tight coverage. And if he does so against an opportunistic Wisconsin defense, maybe they'll get their hands 
on the ball from time to time. Now, Wisconsin's quarterback, Tanner Mordecai, uh, really struggled early in the season. It wasn't great. Uh, had just three touchdowns. Um, when you look at how things went prior to his hand surgery. And then he had his hand surgery, and he actually got better, which is kind of crazy. His QBR improved from 56.7 pre-surgery to 71.8 post-surgery. Now, as far as evaluating what happens in the event in which either one of these teams win, I don't know if there's a ton to take from it, but I think it will be interesting to watch the contrast in styles between LSU and Wisconsin there on January 1st. Now, the Verbo Fiesta Bowl, this will be Jan 1, uh, Monday, 1 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN, Oregon and Liberty. Now, Oregon is playing in their fourth Fiesta Bowl. They've won two of the previous three trips. Liberty is the first Conference USA school to play in a New Year's Six Bowl game in the playoff era. And in the college football playoff era, a group of five teams are actually four and five in New Year's Six games against the Power Five. I would have thought that number would be a little bit better. But I thought to maybe a couple of the other matchups, like Memphis lost big, Western Michigan lost big, a couple others. But obviously Tulane beat SC. Uh, UCF famously beat Auburn. Uh, Houston, I believe, beat Florida State. So, I mean, those were a while back. But the the G5 has played pretty well in these New Year's six games against the Power Five. The problem is in this one, uh, Liberty is a 17.5-point dog. So... Winning the game outright feels rather unlikely. Liberty is 1-5 against AP-ranked opponents. Their lone win came in 2020 against Coastal Carolina. And ironically, their current head coach is Jamie Chadwell, who was on the sideline for that Coastal Carolina team. Now, both these teams can move the football. Both these teams can score. They are among the six FBS programs averaging at least 40 points per game. And among the five, averaging at least 500 yards per game. So going to be pushing the ball down the field, going to be airing it out, going to be really high octane. It'll be a lot of challenges on the defense, that's for sure. Bo Nix is playing in the game. He wrote on his Instagram, quote, one more game. And he's been responsible for 147 touchdowns in his career. That's the sixth most in the FBS history. He has 315 total yards shy of passing Timmy Chang as the second most yards accounted for in FBS history. Timmy Chang had 16,910. If Bo Nix can eclipse the 315 mark, he'll jump into sole second ahead of Timmy Chang. He's also two rushing touchdowns shy of becoming the third player in FBS history with 100 passing touchdowns and 40 rushing touchdowns. The two that have done that prior to him, Central Michigan's Dan Lefevre and Ohio State's JT Barrett. On the other side, Caden Salter, who is a transfer from Tennessee, has had four games with at least 200 passing yards and 50 rushing yards. It's tied for the fifth most in the FBS. And that includes Conference USA Championship game when he threw for 319 and added another 165 on the ground. He's had seven games where he's responsible for at least four touchdowns, trailing only Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. So Caden Salter, another excellent quarterback there going for the Liberty Flames. I like Oregon in the game. I think they are going to be a little ticked off. I think they're going to go out, and I think they're going to handle their business. And to be honest with you, with all due respect to Liberty, I thought SMU should have received the New Year's Six Bowl invitation. The Cheez-It Citrus Bowl, this will be Monday, January 1st, 1 o'clock Eastern Time on ABC. Now, Steve Spurrier famously said, you can't spell citrus without UT. And a lot of Tennessee fans have taken that to heart and have been really upset with him connecting those dots. However, the Citrus Bowl has been really, really good for them. Tennessee is 4-1 and one all time in the Citrus Bowl. That's tied with Michigan and Georgia as the most wins in the bowl history. Now, these two teams, both Tennessee and Iowa, very different. <laughs> Much like we just talked about uh, a couple of moments ago with LSU and Wisconsin, these two teams could not be any more different. Tennessee averages snapping the ball every 21 seconds. That's the second fastest in the country. Iowa runs only 59 plays per game. That's the fifth fewest in the country. Now, Tennessee will be without their star running back, Jalen Wright, who opted out of the bowl game and is declared for the NFL draft. He's the first Vols player with 1,000 rush yards in the season since Jalen Hurd did it 10 years ago in 2013. He went for 1,288 that year. So it's been a while since they've had a running back that was this productive, but he will not be available for the bowl game. Iowa has scored 30 points in a game just once this year. That was against Western Michigan. And the Hawkeyes' 10 consecutive games scoring 30 or fewer is the second longest active streak in the nation. It's tied for the second longest streak over the last 30 years. So Iowa 
is the only FBS team this season to record 10 wins and score less than 300 points. They're the only team to do it twice in the last 20 years. They also did it again in 2004. The big thing I'm watching in this game is I want to take a look at the new quarterback for the Tennessee Volunteers, Nico Iamalieva. All right? Nico Iamalieva. All right? Will he look the part? Joe Milton's out. Nico Iamalieva is in. And this might give us a glimpse into the future of what Tennessee might look like at the quarterback spot. He's big. He's tall. I've seen him throw in person prior to the game last year against Clemson. We called that Orange Bowl game. Watching him throw on the sidelines, he can rip it. But can he be accurate? Because Joe Milton can rip it too, but he was not always accurate. So we'll be watching very closely to see how Nico handles his first start and first real extended action as the quarterback for the Tennessee Volunteers. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. We decided to put together a couple of questions. Well, the guys did. I didn't put these together. I haven't even heard them yet. So we're going to get a little spur of the moment reaction. Uh, on what the outcomes of some of these games might mean. So, guys, kick it off. Where are we going? All right, we're going to start with Michigan. What would it mean for them to win? If Michigan beats Alabama, will their passing offense be able to keep up with Texas or Washington in the national championship? Well, I, first of all, I, I think it's difficult right now to envision them be just altering who they are. And you look at what Texas is, for example. If Texas is victorious, if Washington's victorious, to beat Washington, you feel like you got to score a bunch of points. It just feels that way. That's just the way they're built. They're going to be in a dome, not just in the Sugar Bowl, but also in the NRG Stadium when they tee it up in Houston in the event in which they get there. So to beat either one of those two teams, it does feel like you're going to have to fill it up on the scoreboard. But I actually do think this offense is more equipped to throw the ball than people think. If you watch J.J. McCarthy, now I do think there's some rumors that he was a little banged up down the stretch. He wasn't at 100%. If, in fact, that was true, then he's now had three, three and a half, four weeks to get healthy, to continue to develop that chemistry with the wide receiver core that I think is really underappreciated. I don't think they have a game-changing, you know, Megatron type of receiver, all right? That's okay. You can live without that. But what they have are guys that are in the right place where they need to be when they need to be there, and they're capable of making contested catches when the opportunity presents itself. And I also think Colson Loveland and A.J. Barner, frankly, both tight ends, are very capable of being huge factors in the passing game. We've already seen a million times what Donovan Edwards can do, what Blake Corin can do when they're utilized in the passing game as well. So I think Michigan, there's more in the tank than people realize with how they could potentially open it up through the air, but they're not going to abandon who they are. If they get to the national championship, it's going to be because their offensive line, their defensive front seven, they turned people over and they made plays when they were there to be made on defense and in the run game. So I don't think they're going to abandon who they are, but at the same time, I do think there's probably more in the tank than people realize when it comes to them throwing the football. All right, I got one here. What if Nick Saban wins another national championship? What does that mean for his future? Well, I think a lot of people are wondering, uh, and, and it's almost annually, you get the question, all right, is Nick Saban close to the end? Is he close to the end? I know I get it all the time. And I've said it, same thing right now to friends, uh, on the record, off the record, I'll say the same thing to you guys. I really don't envision a scenario where he is going to be fulfilled doing anything but coaching football. I think he loves it. I think he embraces the grind. I think he also, too, looks at his current roster. And in the event in which they win it this year, he looks at his current roster, and there are a lot of guys that are playing pivotal roles on this offense and on this defense that will be back next year. Now, they'll have to replace some key pieces, but the foundation of this unit is young. And the nucleus of this team is young. So I think even in the event in which he wins it this year, I think he knows he's going to be well positioned next year, especially moving to a 12-team playoff, to potentially win it again. So I don't get the sense that he's shutting it down anytime soon. A lot of people wonder. A lot of people question. A lot of people have kind of circulated rumors. I don't see it. But anything's possible because I don't think he'll be the type that's going to say, yeah, you know, I want to, this is my last year and do a victory lap. No, I think it's going to be an abrupt decision. Hey, I'm done. And he's going to walk away. Uh, but I think knowing how young this team is and knowing that this team could be better next year than they were this year, it'd be a hard thing to walk away from. 
All right, let's talk about the Huskies for a second. If Washington were to beat Texas, do you think they can handle back-to-back physical games when they tee it up against either Alabama or Michigan in the national championship? Well, the thing about Washington is they've been doubted all year long. And another thing that I don't think people realize about Washington is they have seven players that'll be drafted in the top 100 picks. I've had people come up to me and say, well, man, Washington, they're, they're, so, much like, they're so much like TCU. I'm like, no, no, hang on a second. Just because they throw it all over the yard, just because they have you know, a, a great passing attack, they're, they're nothing. They're, their roster is significantly better than what TCU had last year. Significantly better. And, and they're better at, in more important spots. Like they have, a, they have a couple of tackles that will both get drafted in the first three rounds. They have, uh, I think, a running back that, that has a chance to work his way into the top 100. I think Michael Penix has a chance to be a first-round pick. Max Duggan, love him, great player, seventh-round pick. All right, Penix is much better than Max Duggan. Uh, I know Quentin Johnson last year got drafted in the first round. Well, I think Roma Dunze is better than Quentin Johnson. Uh, I think Jalen Polk is as good as Quentin Johnson. So I think you look at their personnel, and they are significantly better than what people realize. And this is the team that has found a way to win how many different ways this year? Whether it's offense uh, against USC, whether it's defense against Arizona State, whether it's offense and defense against Oregon, not once but twice. I mean, this team finds a way. So I I will never doubt Washington's ability to be prepared, and I will never doubt their ability to match the physicality of the teams that would be perceived to be more physical than they are. Okay, I got the last one here. If Texas beats Washington, this is a two-parter, can the Longhorns beat Alabama twice in a season in two, or can the Longhorns hold up against a very physical Michigan team? Well, you guys love the physical questions. Uh, yes, the Longhorns can match up physically. I think Longhorns are the best front seven against the run in college football. I've said it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I think they have maybe as good of a defensive probably defensive line as you'll find uh, with their versatility. I think they have underrated edge defenders. I know they're super elite at defensive tackle. So I think they'll be perfectly fine in the event in which they match up against Michigan. Uh, I also think on the other side, beating Alabama twice is a difficult task for sure. And if you look at that game back in week two, Alabama wasn't who they are right now. Uh, Alabama had a couple of key turnovers in the game. So it will be difficult to do it. But I mean, if there's anyone that matches up well against the other three, Texas matches up as well as anybody. So I think Texas is well positioned. I think all four teams could definitely win the national championship. This is the first time we've gone into the college football playoff where I felt like all four teams could legitimately win it. I think this is the first time. So the fact that all four are capable and all four, it's going to be matchup dependent like it always is. Uh, The NCAA basketball tournament, sometimes it's about matchups and and maybe the best team doesn't always win. This year, it's going to be a little bit about matchups. Like Texas, pound for pound, maybe the best team in college football. But they don't match up great against Washington. Uh, Alabama, maybe maybe the second best team in college football. They don't match up great against Michigan. So there, there's kind of when you look at all these different factors, Michigan doesn't match up great against Alabama. But Michigan doesn't match up great against, against Penn State either. And they, they handle their business with flying colors in that game. So I think when you look at just how these teams have been built, all four are capable, if it goes the way that they want it to go, if they're able to dictate the tone and tempo of the game, they could easily win it. That's the first time I think we've seen a collection of teams this deep and this strong across the board. Introducing the AT&T 5G helmet, the world's first football helmet designed to level the playing field for deaf and hard of hearing players. Radio communication continues to be the primary way professional football coaches and players communicate during the game. But if the highest level of football requires athletes to hear, it presents a significant gap for athletes that cannot. This discovery created an opportunity to apply the power of AT&T's 5G technology to make sports more inclusive. AT&T is a staple of college sports, always exploring ways to use the expertise in connectivity to advance the way coaches, athletes, and fans experience the game. Our collaboration led to the first ever 5G connected helmet. It sends the coach's play call from the device on the sidelines directly to a visual display lens on the helmet, meaning it does not rely on sound or hearing to communicate. So for the first time ever, these players can always get the same information from their coach as their hearing counterparts. The AT&T 5G helmet. AT&T, connecting changes everything. 
Learn more at att.com slash 5G helmet. Helmet is not for sale. AT&T is a proud supporter of the Gallaudet Bison. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to ask all of you to like, rate, and subscribe to the show. Wherever you get your show, we appreciate all of you that have come from all over the world to consume the content. We love doing it, and we hope you guys acknowledge just how much fun we have breaking these things down, hitting it from every angle, identifying possible matchups, possible keys to some of these huge games that are coming up here in just a couple days. So check back with us. Reminder, we will be breaking down both semifinal games from the booth in New Orleans in the Superdome as soon as Texas and Washington goes final. And then we will have that thing posted as soon as humanly possible so that we can have some takeaways and maybe start to look ahead about what the national championship might look like between the victors of both the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl games. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.